we believe in absolute individual freedom that shouldn't be constrained by consensus and groupthink and all those other things as long as we're not harming other people that we have the right to live our, our own lives the way we want to do so. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, as well as links to our YouTube, Stitcher, and SoundCloud accounts, visit our website at nonserviummedia If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. We appreciate all donations, big or small, and your support helps us keep this project going. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 18th episode of the show. I'd like to start this episode out by thanking our generous patrons. This project remains possible because of your generous support. My guest today is a well-respected thinker and theorist in radical spaces who seems to be criminally underground even within the underground. He opposes both capitalism and state socialism and is a proponent of both market exchange and a society where people are able to realize the full value of their labor. Today's guest has written extensively on economics, but has also explored esoterica surrounding sex, drugs, and other related topics. Here's my interview with Joe Peacott. Joe Peacott is an individualist anarchist writer based in the United States. He's a leading figure at Bad Press, a publishing outlet for individualist anarchist philosophy, and has a noted involvement in anti-war activism. His economic and sociological work has been published by the Libertarian Alliance and referenced favorably by leading anarchist scholars such as Kevin A. Carson. Joe Peacott, welcome to the show. Hey, happy to be here. How are you doing today, Joe? I'm doing pretty well. Um, you know, we've been pretty locked down here in Alaska for a month or so. So they finally reopened the YMCA, so I'm back swimming. That's the only workout I really do. I can't run very well. Mm-hmm. My lungs aren't great, so I really missed that. So I've been swimming again for the last week, so I'm feeling a lot better you know, mentally and physically than I have for a while. Yeah, yeah. Exercise is important. And um, hearing that you, you have lung issues, I'm glad that you've been sort of staying away from all the mess that's going on out there. Well, you know, it's tough because I work in a hospital, um, as you probably know. So Mm -hmm. I've been working. I work in cancer care. I haven't. And we're sort of screening people before they come in. So if anybody looks suspicious for COVID, we don't we don't have them come into the clinic until they get tested in a negative. But um, I have had a screen a couple of people who ended up, you know, passing the screening at the front desk and then turned out to have fevers once they were in there. But none of them turned out positive. So I've you know, haven't been exposed that I know of. Um, I keep my distance. I don't wear a mask. I think the masks don't really do much of anything. It's just a feel good measure um, motivated by politics and not science. But I do think the distancing and hand washing are really important. So uh, my nephew lives downstairs. I live with my partner. And so me and my partner, my nephew and his ex-girlfriend are kind of living in this little bubble socially. We don't really associate with anybody else right now, physically. It's kind of weird. It's, a, it's you know, it doesn't feel like a fascist um, occupation <laughs> like some of the, the right wingers talk about, but it's very disorienting and weird. Yeah, it certainly is. It's, um, I'm, you know, considered a quote unquote essential worker also. So I'm having to go into work every day, but I, I can't imagine having to stay home, you know, without any place to go. I mean, It seems maddening and sort of its own hell in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. It's very weird. Yeah, so I have been cautious, particularly, you know, not just for me, but for the people around me and the patients I take care of who are all immunosuppressed or largely immunosuppressed because of the cancer treatment. So I have to reach that as well. Yeah. Well, I do hope to uh, talk a little bit about what it's like being an anarchist in a cancer treatment center. I think you wrote an article about that. Yeah. And hopefully some other articles I'd like to bring up also. But I mean, speaking of, how, how long have you actually been in anarchist spaces? 
So since late 70s, so just a little background. So back when I was 17, I got involved with the Progressive Labor Party. They were this old Leninist, Stalinist, Communist Party split off from the CP years and years ago. They were Maoists initially and then evolved into their own little world. And the main things that appealed to me was their anti-racist stance and their anti-nationalist stance. And they were very, very odd politics. They were sort of not, certainly not libertarians, but they didn't believe that any of the socialist countries were really socialist, that they were all basically authoritarian dictatorships, which they obviously were. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a weird take and considered themselves communists, but they were very authoritarian internally, even though they critiqued the authoritarian states around there. Anyway, over time, um, the New England branch of that group split off and moved in a much more libertarian direction. They certainly didn't become libertarian socialists. Most of them, in fact, are like democratic socialists, social democrat types at this point. I think I'm the only one who ended up becoming an anarchist out of it. But once we sort of got free, freed ourselves, I should say, we, are all, we all volunteered for it. So once we left the party and sort of started thinking and critiquing the work we had done and the ideas we held, I started inquiring more into anarchist thought. Largely, Emma Goldman on the left, she wrote a fair number of individualist essays, right? even though she was a communist herself. And they, they really appealed to me more than the, the sort of the left anarchist stuff, because the left anarchists sounded an awful lot like the people I had worked with before in PL. Even though they weren't status, they were sort of the whole way of thinking and talking was remarkably similar to some of the stuff on the authoritarian left. Mm -hmm. So the individuals appealed to me more. And then I discovered Thomas Zass, who was not an anarchist. Are you familiar with him? Yes, we've spoken about him on uh, previous episodes before, actually. So Thomas Zass actually was way more influential in leading me to anarchism, individualist style anarchism. The, then even Emma Goldman or other people who were true anarchists, because his um, very, very individualist outlook was very appealing to me, especially his critique of mental, of mental illness and so on. And so anyway, after I discovered him, then I moved on. So I sort of then read some stuff from the, the libertarian folks like Rothbard and so on, and then discovered Tucker and Warren and the more traditional American individualist anarchists and that's where I ended up, you know, finding a home, as it were. So late 70s, I guess, is when I sort of became an anarchist. And then I started networking around that time with the Mackay Society in New York. Um, you, f you know those folks? No, actually, I'm not familiar with that. So they were, they were um, Mark Sullivan and Jim Kernikin and a few other folks, Peter Wilson or um, Hakeem Bey. We're all in that same network. They put out, they started out as, uh, many of them were gay. Actually, maybe all of them were, I'm not sure. Although there were a few women. They were mainly gay men who were doing this. And they had started out with a like a one-off publication called Gay Anarchist Tide, and then ended up putting out a zine. And they called themselves like the Mackay Society, after John Henry Mackay, who was an individualist anarchist poet in Germany, who wrote a couple of books. He wrote a book called The Anarchist, which is actually a very, very good book. So I got to know them, went to New York and visited them. And just in having conversations with people of an individualist bent, I sort of solidified my thinking about this stuff. Um, also, I was networking with the folks down in Connecticut in the Lysander Spooner Society. Oh, they were cool. down in Willimantic at the time. And they're all, that's gone away. <clears throat> I'm, I'm totally out of touch with those folks. They sort of thought of myself as an anarchist in the 70s, but then I actually got involved in the scene, as it were, around, the, you know, 79, 80 period. Yeah. And in Boston, there was a group called Black Rose. Well, by the time I knew them, there were two Black Roses. It had been one group that put a, did a lecture series and also put out a zine. Probably a journal is a better word for it. It was a pretty professionally done. And they had split into two groups at some point. They had some internal problems and they, was the, they became the zine group and the lecture group who knew each other, but they were separate projects. And anyway, the... Um, I started going to the Black Rose lectures because that was like the only anarchist stuff around that I could find in Boston and got to know some of those folks and didn't really like it. They were mainly they were way too lefty for my tastes. But a friend of mine, a guy I met later, Jerry Kaplan, who does an anarchist archive project, moved to Boston from Buffalo 
And he got involved with Black Rose and he and I, he's not an individualist either, but he and I really connected. Um, we could really, really, able, really enjoy talking to each other with, with each other and working together. So I met more of the Black Rose people through him. And over time, there was a group of us who was sort of me and some of the Black Rose people and some of the people who just attended lectures decided that we wanted to do something more social and less formal than this lecture stuff. So what we did was we started the Boston Anarchist Drinking Brigade, which was a group of us who would go to the lectures and then go drinking afterwards is how it started. And then that took on took on a life of its own. And I the first thing I wrote, as I said, I told you before when we were texting was the um, deregulating drug use. And that was directly related to something going on in Black Rose because, you know, they, they all called themselves anarchists and I think they were in their heart of hearts, but they, they were having a lecture on, it was about legalizing marijuana, I guess. They had Lester Grinspoon, I think his name was, he's a this Harvard doc who was pro-legalization of drugs in general. So he was okay, but I thought it was odd to have an anarchist lecture series presenting someone who was not an anarchist when there were anarchists around like myself who advocated a more radical position on drugs. And the reason they didn't was one of the members of the group who taught at one of the community colleges said she taught at this largely black community college. And she said that all of her students said they were they were opposed to legalizing drugs and they didn't want to alienate the black community, as they would call it, by taking a more radical position. And I thought, this is bullshit. There's an anarchist who should be taking an anarchist position. That's the whole point. of Right. So I put out this broadside, as we decided to call them, and just left, you know, and gave them out at the lecture to sort of set a discussion. And then the publishing sort of took off as a side project of the brigade after that. Um, so that's kind of how all that, the bad brigade started. So does the uh, Boston Anarchist Drinking Brigade, does that exist at all in any shape, form or fashion anymore other than the uh, publication? No, it doesn't. Um, when I left Boston, it left with me, basically. You know, there was a core group, me and Jerry were really the core. We would get together once a week at a bar, which ch our venue changed over time, depending, you know, for various reasons. And the group was very fluid, and sometimes they were just the two of us, sometimes there would be six or eight of us, and people of very different persuasions. I was the primary individual. Was Peter Cariani, who was from Black Rose, was there, and he's, he wrote some of the essays, one of the essays in, against separatism, for instance, and Liz, what the hell is Liz's name, out in San Francisco? Oh, shit, I can't remember her name right at the top of my head. Anyway, there were a whole bunch of us, and we all sort of spun off across the country at some point. Roger Weaver in Seattle um, was part of the group. Again, we, we had no membership, so it was very fluid. We had this guy um, who was anarcho-syndicalist, who was part of it. And we did, I mean, our biggest event, you know, this is kind of off topic, I guess, but our biggest event was this clam bake we did in Plymouth. So one of our members, Jim Baker, who was also an individualist, who he's also written some of the broadsides, lived in Plymouth and clam bakes were a traditional thing in, in Plymouth. So we had this anarchist clam bake one summer, which was attended by um, individuals, anarchists from Providence, Rhode Island. They had a bookstore called Newspeak. So Joan of Arc was one of the, um, that's not her real name, obviously, but um, that's what she goes by. One of the people who's got a paranoia and I think is still involved with it. She was an individualist. So a bunch of folks came up from Rhode Island who we hadn't met before. Uh, but some objectivists from Boston, the Boston area came down too. Um, and then some, you know, lefty communists who were part of our, lefty anarchists who were part of our circle came down. And it was this great, <laughs> you know, it was one of those, I guess, you know, Peter Wilson would call it a temporary autonomous zone. It was, it was just one of those peak experiences, as it were. Right. Um, having all these various schools of thought, you know, hanging out and communicating and doing stuff. Right. Yeah. A bit of a mot motley crew. Exactly. And so most of us, J Jerry's still in Boston or in Cambridge. Um, Jim Baker's still in Plymouth. But like I say, Roger's in San Francisco. Liz is out in, Roger's in Seattle. Liz's in San Francisco. Phil Fuchella's out in the Bay Area. So we, I'm not really in touch with these folks. If When I was in Seattle, I hooked up with Roger for the first time in like 20 years. And we went drinking together and that was fun. But we, I don't keep in touch with any of them except for Jerry at this point. Really, the, the bad press is really 
just me. You know, I publish stuff by other people like Jason Rogers. Um, I, I publish a bunch of his stuff. He's the guy who wrote the left handed Christianity thing. Hakeem Bay, Peter Wilson. I have some stuff he sent me that I'm rolling out gradually too. And you know, I, there's a few other writers. And then I reprint some of the classics as, as well. Mm-hmm. When I when I don't have enough energy to write my own shit, I'll just put some other stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, it feels like a lonely world out there for a lot of us individualist anarchists. And it's so cool to hear from someone who's sort of been in the game for a while and been involved at a lot of different capacities. So thanks for sharing that. But, you know, speaking of, uh, what does individualist anarchism mean to you? It's a tough question. Basically, I believe that people should be free to do whatever the hell they want as long as they don't interfere with other people's freedom to do likewise. Sort of the old libertarian, you know, American style libertarian way of describing it would be, you know, the right to swing my arm ends at your nose. Mm-hmm. So this concept of equal freedom that, say, um, Warren would talk about, people that, you know, the sort of the old modern philosophy would talk about equal freedom and what he meant by that. And that's kind of where I come from. And groups of people have no right to do stuff that individuals are not free to do or c- cannot do ethically, I guess, is a better way to talk about it. So um, the whole concept of the state is that this group is allowed to do things that they prohibit me from doing. They can kill at their pleasure. They can throw bombs at other countries. They can do stuff like that. But I would be jailed or killed for doing the same thing. So what makes the individualist different than the non-individualist other collectivist anarchists is that we believe in absolute individual freedom that shouldn't be constrained by consensus and groupthink and all those other things as long as we're not harming other people, that we have the right to live our, our lives the way we want to do so. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of the split between uh, individualists and collectivists and other tendencies within uh, anarchist thought sort of surrounds how we conceive of property. And, you know, since Perdone, anarchists have been obsessed with the idea of property. So in your opinion, what constitutes legitimate property? As far as land goes, I think use and occupancy tenure is what makes a property. So that, you know, landed estates are not legitimate property. Legitimate is not a good word because that refers to the law, but it's not acceptable Mm -hmm. property because the landed estates either had slaves or serfs or sharecroppers or employees of some sort. One should only own what one can work and make productive on their own. So I'm not opposed to people selling their labor to to other people, but they should be reimbursed for its full worth. So there's no surplus value generated. I I used to be clear on this. I mean, the use and occupancy thing was fine, but then you want to look at bigger projects, which is something you referred to in one of the other questions, too, is, you know, single farmer farms are not nearly as productive as group endeavors. So what would that look like? I mean, individuals could certainly combine resources and to make projects bigger. But I think it's probably okay if you own a bigger piece of land than somebody else and you pay other people to work it, as long as all the goods get divided equally. They almost become the same thing. If employees are being paid at the full value of what they produce, it's not that different than them all owning this property in common. The situation becomes almost the same. I mean, right now with companies that, you know, I work for a company, I get paid 60 something dollars an hour. The CEO gets paid $10 million a year. I don't think his labor is worth that, frankly. And I'm not complaining about what I get paid, but there is very definitely a hierarchy and some people are rewarded disproportionately to what to the work they put into a project. So if somebody owns land that's too, too much for them to work and they pay other people to work it with them, they're not profiting off the other people's labor because it becomes divided among the group, as it were even though the other people may not technically be owners. The lines blur for me at this point. When I first became an anarchist, it all seemed, uh, yeah, I could read what Warren wrote or what Taka wrote and think, ah, yeah, perfect, this would work, And then, but it doesn't in some ways. And I, my, my thoughts have evolved over time, which everybody's do, which is a good thing. Um, it's, it's, you know, I was accused years and years ago of being very simplistic by some of the, the communists, the anarchist communists, for the, you know, sort of, considered to be like parroting what the old individualists of 100 and 200 years ago said that didn't apply to now. And I think there was some truth in it, that that things are more complex, certainly, than the picture that was painted by the old writers. Right. So 
how might the free society you envision, which incorporates trade to a large extent, protect against the type of economic exploitation you're concerned with? I think the market, a true free market, which doesn't exist and never has existed in any on any large scale, any, any scale outside of an intentional, intentional community would produce that. I mean, I think Warren was right when he talked about cost being the limited price, that it didn't need to be enforced. It would just be how markets work. And so the libertarians, the modern capitalists have written extensively on that, say, The Market for Liberty by the Tannehills or um, stuff by Rothbard or Wendy McElroy. I mean, they, they believe in profit. They believe it's OK for some people to make money off other people's labor, which I do not. But when they talk about the market dynamics, I think even though they believe that profit is okay, I think the market they envision would end up not generating profit. If it were really a free market, why would somebody work for somebody who would pay them less than they were worth when other people would pay them what they were worth? Again, I'm not an, I'm an anarchist, so I, if somebody wants to work for somebody who pays them shit, they should be free to do so. I, I'm not one to regulate other people's actions, but... And again, like in any community, there's going to be people who have different motivations and different ideas about how life should be lived. I think the vast majority of people would be willing to to exchange goods fairly. And if a few people didn't, who cares? Because there's no they're not doing anything bad to me. They're all, if everything's voluntary, whoever wants to put up with their shit is doing it voluntarily because there'll be plenty of options from the other people who do fairness and justice. Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. And it's interesting the way you're using the word profit, because it seems like you're referring to sort of one thing, which is that one gains something illegitimately off of another's labor in some sense. But we can imagine a world of sort of independent producers and cooperatives, you know, where the wage system isn't really a factor. However, you make money off of a product that you're selling. And in fact, that acts as sort of an, an incentive to do so. And you might be able to call that profit without exploitation. I mean, is is that fair to say that that's possible? Right. The way I use profit is the old Marxist, and it's not just Marx, but he's most famous for the labor theory of value, which the traditional American anarchists believed in. You know, the old fat, I'm talking about Warren Tucker and Haywood, that generation of anarchists, they believed the same way Marx did about profit. But you're right. If you just term profit as the return on your labor, well, yeah. I mean, I profit by being a nurse, I guess, right? So you can use the word profit in many senses. So I was using it very specifically as, as the same thing as basically a surplus value, as Marx would call it. Okay, and you explained earlier your thoughts on property and land, but circling back around to that, what are your thoughts on what constitutes an acceptable property claim when it comes to stuff that isn't land? Thanks for bringing me back to that, because I didn't finish. I was trying to make the point about land being different. I mean, I think other stuff, you know, if you get money, get profit from selling your services or your goods, you in turn, you own what you get back and you should be able to buy whatever the hell you want with it. And then you own it. I mean, I think people should own their stuff if it's been gained in some ethical, um, morally acceptable. All these words are tough, you know, ethical, moral. I don't know what the right words are. But if you've gotten the money without fucking somebody else over or propping up somebody else's work, it's your shit. And you should be able to do whatever you want with it. And I don't think we all have to have the same amount of shit. And I don't think there's anything wrong with inequality as long as it's not achieved using unacceptable methods to do so. I think people would be more equal for sure in an anarchist society, but they wouldn't be equal because that's just not how things are. People want to put more effort in me. People want more stuff. They may work harder and have more stuff. And other people want to be slackers and just make enough to get by. And, you know, go, you know, work for somebody else for a few days a week and then spending the rest of the time drinking and smoking. That's OK, but they're going to have less stuff than the other people are. And that's all right, if, because it's not nobody's being harmed by one person having more than something else, because you can't buy power in a society where there is no political power. All right. And um, what's the most frequent objection you hear to individualist anarchism and, and how do you address it? I, I guess it's the inequality the collectivists believe that, say Chomsky, he knew some of the anarchist capitalists already it debated with them or something. He, he knew something about them. 
And I can't remember the whole context, but what he said was that it all sounds good, but he believed that a society based on those principles would be essentially becoming a fascist society. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the word he used, but it would become an incredibly authoritarian society by its nature. And so he was talking about anarchist capitalists specifically, but you could broaden his critique to people who didn't believe in collective enterprises in the same sense that he did. I mean, Chomsky's a syndicalist, and he criticizes the individualists here. I'm, it's coming back to me now as I talk. Besides talking about the anarchist capitalists being proto-fascist, basically, he also said that the individualist ideas were 19th century ideas, and they weren't applicable to the modern era mainly because of this concept of scale. So if you know you can have modern times on Long Island and you have a bunch of people who are exchanging goods and services and living without a government and all that, but it would be impossible to have that an individualist style libertarian community in a city or in a factory or making airplanes that you needed to have these big, you know, one big union to do all this important stuff. I think the criticism comes out of ignorance. We all have our preferences. So ignorance in the sense that not being stupid, but not really understanding what the individualists are saying. Mm -hmm. So if a group of people who are in one big union can figure stuff out together, why couldn't a group of individuals who all had their own shares of the company and consider themselves worker owners, but individual worker owners, why couldn't that work as well as people who saw themselves more as a group? But the collectivists and the syndicalists in general just can't see that. They can't see that you're not allied in some formal way mm -hmm. and have meetings all the time and all this other shit that you can't get work done. <laughs> and I just don't see any reason why, if it worked in, in modern times, why it couldn't work in a bigger society. I just, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't get it. But yeah. I could alternatively say to Chomsky that syndicalism is also a 19th century idea, which is way, way past its prime. All of these, all of these schools of thought come out of, you know, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've fancied them up for the modern world, but it's not a legitimate criticism to say we're, we're stuck in, the, in this, you know, paradigm that doesn't apply to the modern world. Yeah, it's a hand wave and a hypocritical one, especially since your ideology is coming out of the same time period. Right. Okay, and uh, what do you think, so that's one of the most typical objections to individualist anarchism. What do you think is one of the more stronger objections to individualist anarchism? I guess the strongest one is the concern about, about inequality. Strongest in the sense that I think that's the, an argument that appeals to so many people who are trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. and trying to make a better world, that they countenance inequality as being acceptable. And individualists, whether they're capitalists or non-capitalist individualist anarchists, all can see or believe that inequality is okay. Not $10 million a year versus $60 an hour, like in my case with the CEO, because I don't believe that could happen because people can't work that much if they're doing real labor. Right. I mean, the CEOs get it is because it's because of the government, basically, that allows corporations to run the way they do. Right. Right. But um, quality. So somebody wants to make have twice as much stuff as me. That's OK. If they want to work twice as hard for it. I, again, I, I think I'm going back to if we're going to be anarchists of any sort, we're going to be different people. And I think their concerns about what how mm -hmm. inequality would badly affect people are misplaced because the world would be a different place. It wouldn't be like now where the inequality is so vast and just so unfair, a little bit is not going to be unfair. And I can't see, again, I can't see, unlike the anarchist capitalists who can see people being millionaires in an anarchist society, I don't think that could happen if you had a truly free market. Throughout your work, you promote strong property rights and market exchange, yet you also, in your writing, seem deeply concerned with labor issues environmentalist concerns, animal welfare concerns, and so on. Most political ideologies would see these values as in conflict in one way or another. So how do you bridge these tendencies? Well, I don't see the conflict. And I, I think assumptions are made that only people who are collectivists and who want to sing Kumbaya are going to care about animals. And I just don't see any basis for that. 
you know, that these these sort of good liberal and the good sense of liberal ideas were largely associated with a more individualist point of view going way, way back to the foundation of sort of the foundation of modern liberalism in the UK back in the, you know, the days when the, the liberal party, but they were they were non-political liberals in that. Tucker had a network of English individualist anarchists who were sort of in that tradition. Spencer is another one who comes out of that kind of liberal, classical liberal tradition. And the classical liberals were very open minded about all the same type of stuff. So I, I, I think people associate individualism these days with right wing ideas in general. And I just think that's misplaced. I think individual what passes for individualism on the right is not individualism. I mean, I think the libertarian right, I mean, the sort of the political libertarian right is different, but I think much of the right is not individualist at all. They're very much leaders and followers and commitments to groups and nations and all that stuff. I don't think they really are individuals. I think it's a misconception. Do you think there's such a thing as toxic individualism? I mean, I'm, I'm very social. So even though I'm a very individualist bent and I'm very self-sufficient. I love being around other people. Yeah. I love living in cities and all that stuff. And I think there are some people who are what, you know, the rugged individualist, right? They want to go out west and have their farm and have their gun and then, you know, go into town once a week to buy stuff, but otherwise live on their own. Mm. I don't think, I mean, toxic, I don't think is the right word for it. It's just a different preference. It's a more extreme preference for solitude and and self-sufficiency. Um, but I don't hear that many of them. I think the rugged individualists out west were the same ones who wanted the army to go kill the Indians so that they could have their shit. So I think most of what passes for rugged individualism isn't individualism at all. And the, and the, and the small number who are that way, eh, let, let them be. I mean, I don't, if they're that individualist, they're not going to have anything to do with me, so I'm not really going to give a shit. When you brought it up, I was thinking more that you were referring to someone like like the objectivists, like Ayn Rand or something. And, you know, her stuff, she's not a great writer. The only novel that's a real novel is We the Living, which is a great book. I don't know if you've read that. But last year, I actually listened to them all. I would just put them on while I was working out. And so I did The Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, We the Living. And what's the, that little one, Anthem? I mean, her, her books are full of caricatures. And they're political positions made into people, kind of. And they just don't work. But anyway, the reason I brought it up, like I said, the We the Living was just an, such a great critique of the Bolsheviks and had real people in it and sympathetic characters and so on. And even in Atlas Shrugged, I mean, like the Dagny Taggart character is the only real character in that book, in my opinion. And I don't find that kind of individualism toxic. I think all those people, even though they were cookie cutter images of a different po different political positions, the people in Gulch Gulch were all working together. They weren't, I mean, they were individualists, but they recognized they needed a community. I guess in the same sense that Bakunin would talk about it, right? You need community so you can be an individualist. When I hear toxic individual, I always think of Rand. And one other thing on her, since I got started on it, there's a very interesting book written by David Kelly, who was one of her intellectual, you know, descendants, as it were. And he's one of these guys who's very controversial as too. He'll go on and when they interview on television saying greed is good and all this other crap just to get piss people off and so on. But he wrote this book called Unrugged Individualism, which makes an objectivist case for benevolence, which is a really, it's a very short essay, but it was really, really good where he argued essentially that to be a good objectivist, you also need to be nice to your neighbors because you want them to be nice back, kind of. So it, it's interesting how this individualism and communitarianism kind of connect on some level. I wrote this essay on um, Warren, which I, I think I reprinted it in my zine. I wrote it for Jonathan's zine in England. It never got published. Oh, I did. No, I did get published there. I'm called, uh, I think, a Communitarian Individualist or something, which was really clear in his stuff, you know, that he needed to be around people. He wanted to be around people. Even they took this extreme individualist position on everything. And, you know, the, the founding principle of modern times, in his words, was, you know, mind your own business. But it was a community. I want to move forward a little bit into the topic of uh, healthcare. In your opinion, what's wrong with healthcare as we know it? Well, to be my usual simplistic self, the state. 
Healthcare is really expensive in the United States for all sorts of reasons. But one of the primary drivers of the cost is the restrictions on production of doctors. The state limits the number of doctors and it creates this scarcity which wouldn't exist in a market system. You know, there would be as many doctors as people needed in a market system. Too many people wouldn't go and get trained because there wouldn't be any jobs. I mean, it's they, they do formally and legally restrict the number of doctors that can be created. So, I mean, that's, that's one piece of it. Yeah. State enforced intellectual property is another piece of it so that these drug companies make enormous amounts of money because of patents and, and, and such. You know, my nephew and I were debating this the other day. We were talking about intellectual property in general. And he was saying, well, why there wouldn't be any scientific innovation if people couldn't make money out of, off of it. And I believe you can make money off of it. I think intellectual curiosity and a thirst for knowledge is just part of the human condition. Not everybody. Some people, like I said, are just slackers and more power to them. Back in the day before people became you know, billionaires from scientific discoveries, people learned. I mean... Newton and Michelangelo and Leonardo and people like that weren't poor, but they weren't rich either. Yeah. I mean, Leonardo was incredible how forward thinking he was and all this stuff. And that was he had patrons, he had people supporting him, but not anything like the scale of what happens today. So I think getting rid of government restrictions on the market, getting rid of intellectual property, getting rid of the controls on numbers of doctors getting rid of controls on alternative practitioners, you know, non-doctors doing stuff that only doctors can do now. There is incredible amounts of money that could be saved by pretty simple measures. There used to be a market in healthcare. I mean, let me step back and just say, I mean, I think chiropractic is bullshit, frankly, and I think a lot of these alternative healing systems are bullshit. But allopathic medicine, when it became the official medicine in the United States, was also bullshit. Only over time did it develop into a real science. They were still bleeding people in the old medical schools. And that evolved into modern medicine. But at some point, there was a market. Anybody could hang up a shingle and, you know, do what they wanted without having to jump through regulatory barriers. You know, people can learn to be doctors without going to medical school. It should be, you know, I believe in outcomes-based education that people, if you know how to do the work, I don't give a fuck how you learned how to do it. I remember back in Boston, there was a case where this somebody had been practicing as a doctor for a couple of years. I don't know whether it was a surgeon or a medical doctor and was a good doctor to, by all accounts. They found out he had never gone to medical school and they pulled his license and I don't know they put him in jail or something. But it just seems absurd to have this one way path to being a healer mm -hmm. because he was a, he was just as good as the other doctors. He just didn't go through the same process to getting there. It reminds me in a non-medical context of, you know, lawyers like Lysander Spooner read the law, as they used to say it, in a law office and became a lawyer. He didn't have to go to law school. He just learned it at somebody's elbow. Anyway, so I mean, I'm kind of rambling on this thing. I've written about it, as, as you know, a number of times. I think there should be a market in healthcare just like anything else. And when people compare the American system to the Canadian system or the system in the UK, they make legitimate criticisms of the situation here and how expensive it is and limits on access to care. But all these other systems are equally flawed. They're just flawed in different ways. So here in the US, you don't have to wait for a hernia operation. You you know, there's, a horror, there's the occasional horror story. I remember Molly Ivins God rest her soul, um, wrote this article one time about a woman who died in Texas because she couldn't get into a hospital because she didn't have insurance. And it happened. And that shit's going to happen. People die in the UK because they can't get cancer treatment because the NHS won't allow it. They won't pay for it. And the drugs are fabulously expensive. So all these different systems are flawed, which is not to deflect criticism from the American one. I'm just saying that part of the argument about healthcare is socializing it whether with a government or not a government is the solution and making it free at the point of care. Again, if you're a communist, then you do believe that food should be free and you shouldn't have to pay for anything. But if you're not like I am, where I believe that there will be some means of exchange, I don't see why health care should be free. I mean, it's no more essential than food. And I don't think food should be free. But anyway, that's so I guess, I mean, long story short, what's wrong with the system is that there's no competition it's a government protected monopoly and just like all monopolies it's bad yeah i hear you i mean my conception of a fruitful approach to healthcare post-state 
would not only include competition, as you mentioned, but also a whole stigmergic array of human experimentation in open source medicine and DIY schemes, too. I mean, why not let a thousand flowers bloom, right? I often think of Roderick T. Long's article called How Government Solved the Healthcare Crisis. There's just a lot of fruitful ways of approaching this thing that the current system simply does not have room for. Anyways, how has working in a hospital helped to inform your anarchist thought, if at all? Hmm. Good question. I mean, I think it's no different than any other social interactions I have in terms of informing my anarchist ideas, because when I see people and the way they react to the healthcare system and to doctors and so on, it's troubling because people look to experts for advice and direction and let themselves be pushed around a lot. When people are in crisis and not feeling well, they're way more prone to just yield to the ideas of somebody who they think knows more than they do. But it's just this idea of letting other people make your decisions for you, which gets writ large, as it were, in healthcare. Troubling is not the right word. I'm not troubled by it anymore, but it shows the problem in this society in, in great relief. Taking a look at the human condition and seeing how people react in crisis is, you know, it reinforces some of my ideas about the problem with authority is that people like it, want it, voluntarily accept it. The other thing is that the healthcare system is incredibly hierarchical. In oncology, there's less hierarchy in a sense. All the doctors are on first name basis with the nurses and so on, which is not universal in healthcare by any means. We're a sort of a small circle of friends in a weird way, even though cancer is the second biggest killer in the, in the United States. The oncology treatment community is kind of small and everybody knows each other. And I like that piece. But looking at it more broadly, the hospitals are very authoritarian. They're very hierarchical. And, you know, they like to pretty it up. They no longer call themselves managers. They call themselves leaders. And we're no longer employees. We're called caregivers and all this other bullshit. But it's yeah, newspeak a bit. Right. Exactly. It's very command and control. And so I think that's probably true of most other jobs, though, so I don't think it's specific to health care. Yeah, I guess it, I mean, it just reinforces my ideas about my opposition to authority, because I don't think it serves anyone well in health care. What change to health care is most immediately necessary and would help others? Um, the thing that would help people most, and this is going to be totally heretical coming from the individual's anarchist, is the expansion of Medicaid so that everybody can more easily get health care than they currently can. I just said they can get it, but there are way more, too many hoops to jump through. And it's very ne- difficult to negotiate as an individual. Medicaid, which is just poor people's, you know, like welfare, me- health care. I think would benefit a lot of people who currently aren't getting the care they they want because they can't afford it. Anybody can walk into the emergency room at Providence Hospital up here or Boston City Hospital in Boston or name the welfare hospital wherever you are and get taken care of. And they'll get a bill and they don't pay it. Nothing happens. But getting into a primary care, which is the key piece of making people healthier, which I think is one thing the NHS does promote is they rely heavily on their GPs. The U.S. theoretically does, but in real life, people don't use it. And partly it's money, but that's not all it is. It's just the attitude of Americans about stuff is is different in some ways. But if people could just get primary health care, it would offload a lot of crap from the emergency departments, hopefully help people lead more healthy lifestyles. I mean, although I, I, that would need to be proven to me, too. I think theoretically, getting primary care would keep people healthier. Yeah, so long story short, I'm going to be a heretic once again and just say Medicaid for all. Okay. In an article you wrote titled The Poverty of the Welfare State, you say, quote, poor people are victimized by corporations, not because the state has failed to protect them, but because the state has prevented them from protecting themselves. What did you mean by that? And what inspired you to write this article? <laughs> I have no idea what inspired me to write it. But that's the one that got reprinted in the book, right? Yes. In Markets Not Capitalism. That's actually how I came across your work. Oh, yeah. And those guys, which, which is fine. I had no idea they were doing that. I just like, shit, I was, what do they call it? Doing a vanity Google. And just, I was like, my shit's in this book. (laughs) I take other people's shit with me all the time. Yeah, so I'm thinking I had been reading 
something about how people took care of themselves before the welfare state. And that kind of inspired me to critique the welfare state. It's a book on my shelf which I haven't read yet from, from mutual aid to, to the welfare state, which makes make similar arguments that people were, were able to organize their own stuff, perhaps not necessarily as well or as robust as people do with the welfare state. But, you know, housing associations and unions could contract with doctors to provide health care to their members and things like that. And so I think that's where I ended up coming to this. I'm not sure what I was reading at the time, but looking at it, it was 1998. Shit. How can I remember that far back? <laughs> I think the way to fix healthcare is to abolish the state. When you ask me practically what's going to help with most people right now, it's more state. So I I get where people come from on this, but the whole point of being an anarchist, I mean, I would say that to you, and, I, and it's, I'm happy for, you, for other people to hear me say that, but anarchists should be promoting anarchist ideas. In my mind, because well, otherwise, why call yourself? Why be an anarchist? Because the revolution or wh- whatever is not practical right now. We need to do halfway measures. We need to do reforms, and therefore, you know, we should be supporting extending welfare. And I would counter that by saying that anarchists should be not be taking the positions that the socialists will take and that other lefties will take. They don't need there's so few of us who gives a fuck whether we support these things or not. But even if you think that's that will be helpful, like, say, Medicaid, I'm not going to be out there writing articles about extending Medicaid. I'll let the California Nurses Association do that because they will. And they'll be way more effective advocating for it. And that will probably help people in the short run. As an anarchist, we need to present anarchist ideas, not present statist ideas. There's plenty of statists to do that. Even if you think it's better in the short term, leave it to the fucking statists to do it because they're going to. We don't we need to be out there creating pro freedom ideas, as I said earlier. So that's kind of a sideline. But what I meant by the, the relationships between the corporations and the workers is that so I was there was a group here that were put on a May Day show for a few years. It was unionists, some teamsters, some other folks. They called themselves the stand up guys. And they would be like sort of a flash mob, as it were. There were only a few of them. There was like probably 10 to 12 of these guys. But like if something was going on someplace, they'd show up to help with the demonstrations and so on. I wasn't a former member of the stand up guys, but I knew them through networking. And so they organized this May Day program, which was a sort of a staged reading of some stuff that happened around the Haymarket events in, 80, in 1886. We would, be, we would be assigned different roles, and I was one of the reporters, so I had my script. And we would just do this. We would you know, put on hats and stuff, but not full costumes. And we would just do this on May Day every year or on the May Day weekend. And it was kind of cool, you know, get a few, you know, 50, 100 people out there. It was a fun thing to do. Anyway, so the program, however, was written by David Schaff, who is a NLRB lawyer, so National Labor Relations Board. So it, I still enjoy doing it. I think it did promote anarchist ideas in some sense. At least it introduced people to the idea that there were anarchists. I wasn't one of the anarchists, but there was stuff that the anarchists in, in Chicago said. So meanwhile... Basically, we do this skit, as it were, about the Haymarket events, and then Schaff comes in at the end and reads a script about how this started the eight-hour day movement, and, you know, in the 1930s or 1940s, the National Labor Relations Act was passed, and God came down from the heavens. So, connecting anarchists with the National Labor Relations Act, to my mind, is fucking bizarre, because what the National Labor Relations Act did was disempower workers, largely. It helped institutional unions, but it took away a lot of the union's clout, because basically the unions traded off strikes for mediation and binding arbitration and things like that. That was the trade-off in the NLRA. So before that, the typical worker's response to being treated like shit was to vote with their feet and leave and strike. And it was a very effective tactic. It was very disruptive for businesses, however. And they realized that that era, there was a, the unions were still strong enough. They had to deal with them in some fashion. So basically, that's what NLRA did. It said, you can't strike anymore. Wildcat strikes are no longer OK. Instead, you'll have binding arbitration. So when you come to you can't meet, have a meeting of the minds, you can file grievances, you can have negotiations and then you can have a disinterested third party make the decision for you. So the labor laws in this country, in fact, restrict the rights of workers more than they do the rights of companies. And that's where I was going with that. Um, it was kind of a lengthy explanation for where I came where I came from. But 
there are certainly things labor laws do. I was a union steward or a grievance officer for years and years. So there's um, some laws that, like there's minimum wage laws, which there's arguments pro and con on them, so I'm not even going to go there. Um, but probably a better, a more helpful than not to the individuals who were in those low wage jobs. And then there's the Labor Stand- Fair Labor Standards Act, F- FSLA, which standardizes some stuff that's about benefits and earn time and how differentials are applied to hourly wages and so on. And that arguably is better for the workers, but the fact that unions have had their power taken away, basically everybody has a no strike clause. That's standard boilerplate language in every contract these days. So if you strike during the contract, you're in the wrong. You can only strike in between contracts. And that kind of stuff was institutionalized by the National Labor Relations Act and the whole web of labor laws. So looking at strictly at sort of labor union piece of it, the unions were disempowered by the National Labor Relations Act, disproportionate to the gains they made. But in general, also, I think the other point I would make is that corporate ownership is a government institution so that if you have a you have a business and you have stockholders and you have workers and so when profits fall they fire workers they don't cut dividends right but just what's happening now when people are out of work some of these big fucking banks are still paying dividends as they lay people off i mean i think that's institutionalized the property property and ownership are institutionalized and defended by the state so that those people are considered owners, whereas the workers who contribute all the labor are not owners, even though they're there every day in the factories. And I believe that people have the right to control the place they work and workers should take over the factories. I absolutely believe that. And they can't because of the government. Government. I think they have a better claim to ownership than the people who actually own all these businesses because they're the work. That's the lefty in me. I was making two points. One is that labor relations, you know, labor laws don't help workers and capitalist property relations are imposed by the government. And if the government wasn't there to send out their cops to defend the companies, workers could take them over. So, yeah. So that's the lefty in you. In Bad Press, you republished an article titled Anarchy, Neither Capitalist Nor Communist, where the author was sort of punching left and criticizing, totalizing collectivist economic arrangements. If you wouldn't mind touching on why you felt it necessary to publish that and how it might interact with your sort of, as you say, leftist tendencies for workers to want to take over corporations and stuff like that. I mean, my personal experience in Boston, as I said earlier, with leftists was largely good. We got along pretty damn well, you know, in this sort of very vague, amorphous group, the, the Boston Anarchist Drinking Brigade. Even the folks who didn't attend that often, we would run into each other at demonstrations and such. And we were all over the map with our politics. And, you know, people know about Goldman writing about individualism and so on. And I accept that, even though she was a communist. And I just came across this sort of randomly and published it because I just wanted to basically make the argument, why can't we all get along, as they say? I mean, I'm very critical of the syndicalists, as I've been several times in this talk with you, but the sort of more traditional communists, temperamentally, I don't share their views, but I think in some cases, like when I was talking about land ownership earlier, sometimes in the operational either system would end up with very similar results if that helps i mean i think you can like i said earlier i personally like being around other people would be involved in joint projects presumably of all sorts the kind of work i do i can't do alone for instance we would have to have some kind of joint operation now whether it was officially a commune or officially a group of individuals depending on the people involved may not look very different and that was part of the motivation and i think you know it's easy for me to say, I guess. I mean, I feel that there's way more criticism of individualists by communists than the reverse. I mean, I've been very critical of them today because that's what we're talking about. But in general, there's way more demonization of individualists by communists than the reverse. And so I was just trying to reach out to my comrades, as they say, by putting this out. And I didn't say who it was. That might have made it more effective. But um, I just these were always published anonymously. Just that was just our style with the broadsides. The broadsides were always a joint. I mean, I wrote most of them. Jim Baker wrote a couple. This was Netlau. I also have one by Kyle Hess. One of them is written by Kyle Hess as well. And I didn't attribute it to him either. You know, I've had some weird shit happen with the lefties. 
this is a little background. Back in 86, I went, a group of us from the Lysander Spooner Society went out to the planning conference for the, the 1986 Haymarket events. Were you, were you around in those days? No, no, I sure was not. I was born the year that you published your first article. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, so in, in 1986, people around the country sort of independently came up with the idea of having a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Haymarket events in 1886. So a planning conference was planned in Chicago before it. And a bunch of us drove out from Connecticut. I was living in Massachusetts, but I drove down to Connecticut. We took off from there, out to Chicago for the planning conference. And it was a weird group. I mean, most of them were sort of lefty anarchists, but there were also some people from a group called the Shimo Underground, which considered themselves a, a sort of crossbreed of, of Marxists and anarchists and such. Some of them came to the meeting and the most of the anarchists in the room wanted to exclude them from the meeting because they weren't anarchists. And it, it really got kind of silly because one of the people said, well, we don't want them here because they might steal our ideas. And I'm like, but wouldn't that be a good thing <laughs> if they're stealing our ideas, right? Not <laughs> so it got to be the great conversations. All, when all was said and done, they wanted to work by consensus. And I blocked consensus and said they should be allowed to stay. Because, like, why not? This isn't, you know, it was not a secret society. You know, what the fuck? If you don't like what they say, ignore it. And so anyway, so I blocked consensus, which pissed everybody off. And so then they decided to have a vote. And of course, I voted against it, but I was the only one who voted against banning them from the room. So I sort of pissed a bunch of people off in Chicago. And then we went back for the conference and I ended up getting arrested. So at the, as, as the conference was winding down, we were walking down the, what, the Miracle Mile, whatever, the big shopping street in Chicago. At some point, a, a group went into a store and broke a display case and took off. And that pissed off the cops who were just sort of what, shepherding us around, but keeping hands off. And they started arresting people and I got caught in the dragnet, as it were, and spent the night overnight in jail. And it was an interesting experience because then most of the people in jail with me also were lefties of some sort, although one was kind of a he was kind of a left wing Republican type. He was weird. He was a very weird politics, but a, a really decent guy. And so I sort of got a good reputation for getting arrested with all the lefties there. So people were nicer to me, were giving me more slack after that ex experience. And then several years later, there was a conference in Philadelphia. They started having these anarchist gatherings around the country that started in 86 with that ham market events. And I went there and we were in a storefront and it was the IWW was strong in Philadelphia at the time. And um, I can't remember what her name is, the person who was there. She's one of the editors of one of the journals. Anyway, we were in this space having a, you know, get, get together, just coffee and snacks or something the night before the conference. And. I met up with Bob McGlynn, who I only you know Bob. He used to do Neither East Now West, which was a it was the first zine in the U.S. to sort of cover the the anarchists in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Um, right. So so anyway, so we we met up with Bob McGlynn and we went out drink for drinks. And of course, it turned out the place we went to drink was a cop bar, which we didn't know. So people were like giving us the hairy eyeball because we went there to drink. We weren't locals. We went there to drink, right? And then we went to, anyway, so that was earlier in the day. We went to this celebration later, and there's one of our friends, Lisa, who's part of the brigade, was taking pictures of us. And some of the security culture types told us she couldn't take pictures anymore. And she says, fuck you, I can take pictures of my friends. I thought you guys were anarchists or something. And it's out of beef. And then somebody said to us, what, what do you, you Bostonians just come to conferences to disrupt them? I'm like, what the fuck? We had this bad reputation and not even all of us were individualists. It was just because we like opened our mouths and shed shit and well, and it pissed people off. But anyway, but, but largely, I mean, those, those were kind of one offs where I pissed people off. Generally, I got along pretty well with the lefties here and in the UK as well. <laughs> um, you know, I knew a bunch of lefties from the book fair and so on. So anyway, long story short, I was this was just in the spirit of making friends with people on the other side. All right, cool. So I, I want to move on to some crowdsourced questions that I have here. The first one is, you've written a bit about queer and sex issues in the past. What is the significance of sexual freedom in the fight for freedom more broadly? I think freedom is all one piece. Sexual freedom and black liberation and women's liberation and all those stuff. Freedom covers it all. However, I, f I think the historic gay movement was much different than the current one and was less, I, I disapproved of it less. I remember groups like Fagrag, uh, the Foothill Faggots for Freedom in Boston put out a zine called Fagrag. 
Charlie Shively, who was a, um, he's edited some of Josiah Warren stuff and he edited the collective works of Lysander Spooner. So his individuals was like a key player in that group, as was Tom Reeves, who co-wrote a book on the draft with Kyle Hess. They were anarchists in this group and they still had this identity politics thing going on. But it was more of the sexual outlaw take, which not everybody agreed with in those days, but that was kind of the radical position. It was to not wanting to be like everybody else and emphasizing the differences and saying that gay sex was liberatory and, you know, cruising and having a thousand partners a year was liberatory and all that. Of course, AIDS put the damper on that. Um, and it turned out not to have been that good an idea for a lot of these folks. But the whole feel of it was different. It was very rebellious. Being gay was rebellious in those days. And now it's now it's not. Now it's Anderson Cooper co-parenting with his ex and being on, you know, public, you know, and talking about it on television. Like, who gives a fuck? Jesus Christ, I thought it was great that the gays could have, make, have a reason to get on the military. Like, this is awesome. People can get proposed that way just by somebody of the same sex. And now you can't do that anymore. Now, if there ever was a draft, they'd draft all the homos, too. These things have been... I mean, they've been good for people who want to be conventional, and that's, I guess, good for them. But, I mean, the anarchist press has been sympathetic to some of this stuff, like the marriage stuff. I mean, I've seen individual anarchists write about it in a positive way. So anyway, yeah, I think I think sexual politics done right could be challenging to people. And there was also women's – there was a women's sex journal that came out of Boston, which was later than Fagrag. Fagrag was still around when I started doing politics in the 80s. But there was like some really challenging radical stuff, even though not anarchist necessarily. Fagrag was because they were anarchists writing, you know, writing in it. Like the sex radicals in you know, the historic sex radicals in you know, the anarchist movement that um, the folks out in Kansas in Valley Falls, they, Lucifer, the folks around Lucifer, for instance, they talked about sex do it in terms of homosexuality, although there was some of that. They had the, um, the there was a letter about the guy who <clears throat> went around giving blowjobs that they published that got them put in jail. <laughs> there, was, there was some weird, some funny story that they posted this letter. He was asking for advice and he was saying that he used to, you know, blow guys in toilets and all this stuff. And then nobody would write something like that in those days. And they did. <laughs> hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. Uh, another listener asks, what was it like being an individualist anarchist in the 80s and 90s? What was the reaction like from the more right wing libertarian movement and communist anarchists? Well, I've addressed this to some extent already that I generally got along well with others. And then there were situations when I, I pissed people off and they were critical. I, mean, I remember there was I was trying to find it. Somebody wrote me a letter one time back in the days when people wrote letters saying something to the effect of I was this right wing nut or something. I can't remember who it was, but I used to say my advertising, my flyers that I would quote the comments people had made on it. And I, I couldn't find it. If I find it, I'll send it away. It was it was pretty it was pretty cool. Um, I, I was very, very critical of me. And very nasty. But that was an outlier. People dimly were okay with it. And like I say, there was a few groups. There was like the Lysander Spooner folks and the Mackay Society folks in New York were not huge, but they were there and had zines. And people kind of knew about us and were relatively tolerant most of the time. From the right, it's weird. So one of my friends, Blaine, who lives in Long Island now, he was in the LP. I was around the LP and became an anarchist after that. So he knew some folks, and they, they they were a few LP types around town, but we didn't interact with them that much. I mean, I knew some of them, and it was funny. I went to the, the state fair up here in Alaska. They had, The Libertarian Party usually has a booth. And I went in one year, and I was wearing some button or something, and, and he was like, oh, yeah, we, we, we believe in that too, whatever it was. So I somehow got onto Lysander Spooner or something, and he had no idea who I was talking about. But back in the day, I mean, the, the sort of the, the intellectuals in the movement, the Rothbards and Hesses and those people, they were very familiar with the individualist tradition. And back in the 80s, people were more likely to know that there was some connection between what they were saying and what we were saying and were tolerant of it. The DLP guy wasn't hostile or anything when we talked, but I corresponded to some extent. I mean, Sharon, Presley, Sharon and I have met up several times. We get along really well. Although she, I posted something on Facebook, which she attacked for some reason, it was totally non-political. My friend Roger in Seattle had posted something about an online poll about, you know, how long should you wait after somebody, some asshole has died before you can talk bad about him? Something to that effect. I just thought it was funny and I reposted it and 
She said, it's never okay to talk about people who've died. I'm like, <laughs> she and I got along very well. She's an anarchist, though, too. Although it's weird. She's an anarchist who votes. Like, well, I guess a lot of lefties do as well. But McElroy has been more standoffish. I think she's a way better writer than Presley. Um, they're my two the people I know sort of most best in the, in the movement, which is why I'm talking about both of them. Um, I published Wendy's um, article on, I think it was Contragradualism, it's called, which was a very important article to me and, and my way of thinking about stuff and sort of putting it together. So anyway, Sharon and I are buddies. Wendy and I are not. When I wrote to her to just let her know I was republishing and she just said thanks and didn't like ever interact with me again, which is fine. She doesn't need to. But since we're talking about folks on that end of things, she, in this contragradualism, she describes herself as an abolitionist. I mean, my critique and hers are quite similar. Like I said, when you asked about sexual freedom and I said, well, freedom is all of one piece. That's kind of the argument that Wendy makes in this article. She takes it from Garrison. So William Lloyd Garrison, he was an abolitionist. And not just because he believed in abolition of slavery, he believed in the immediate abolition of slavery. It would not countenance half measures. You know, he burned the Constitution at a, at, a, at a picnic in central Massachusetts. He did all this fucking crazy radical shit. And he had the position that you abolish slavery immediately. And the arguments that, well, these black people don't know how to take care of themselves without their masters and blah, 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 make, make excuses having more gradual measures. He said, no, slavery is wrong. You need to get rid of it. And so McElroy in this article, makes the same point about the state. You don't demand that the state do anything. And when the state rolls something back, you don't protest it. Because we believe everything the state does should stop now. And when part of it stops, that's all to the good. It may not be the part we want to stop first, but if you take a gradualist approach, you're never going to get there. You have to be, it's kind of what I was saying about the anarchists earlier, that anarchists should be saying anarchist shit. That's kind of her position. It's like, we're abolitionists. We're not gradualists. It doesn't mean we really believe we're going to push the anarchy button. I think it's Barry Rothbard would have talked about it because that was a debate for a while in the libertarian movement was like, if you had the button that you could push and when you abolish the state tomorrow, would you push it? And that was kind of the acid test for the real anarchists because there were excuses about why you shouldn't push it because, well, people aren't ready. People aren't this. Well, it doesn't matter. If the state is bad, it should be eliminated tomorrow, mm -hmm. period. But anyway... So I just went off the engine there when we were talking about the, the, them. But, and I was in touch with Samuel Conkin back in the day, too, a little bit. And he was he called himself an anarchist, but was really an anarchist, too. And yeah, so anyway, so I, I got along fine with those people in the libertarian, you know, the non-anarchist libertarian world, or the anarchist capitalist world pretty well, too. As many listeners of this show know, I'm pretty familiar with Conkin. Uh, we've mentioned him on the show a few times. Can you expand on your relationship with him and maybe how you've uh, interacted with his work? Well, you know, I was very intrigued by a lot of his writings. And so I took out a membership in the Movement of the Libertarian Left, I think it was called at the time. And, you know, he sends you this official letter and gives you a membership number and all this stuff. But was very, very authoritarian sort of attitude towards the organization. I mean, it's common on the left. I mean, but Bakunin did the same thing on the left. It was very authoritarian, had very structured organizations and secret societies and so on, as I mentioned earlier. And certainly the CNT was hierarchical in Spain. But his outside critique, his critique of society was so anti-hierarchical. I was shocked at how hierarchical he was internally. And he was the, called himself the chairman or something stupid like that. <laughs> so at some point I said, like, look, dude, I don't need to be part of this group. It's like this. I don't really like this stuff. He was, he was kind of put off by it. Anyway, so I, I just corresponded with Conkin a little bit. I did like his critique to some extent. Um, I did meet somebody, Mike Gunderloy, who did Fact Sheet 5. You familiar with Fact Sheet 5? No, I'm not. Okay, it, it was a zine of zines, as it were, back in the days when everybody had their zines, right? There were thousands of them out there. And it was like a review of zines. And he was had this colossal collection of zines, and he would just write reviews and put it out periodically. He was part of the movement of liberty here and left back in the day, too. I didn't know him through that, but when I met him, I was like, oh, I used to see your name on the membership list. But it was an interesting group. But I mean, just one, I just like to expand a little bit on this authoritarian thing on the, on the right. I mean, it happened with Konkin. But also, like one of my favorite books is The Moon is a Hash Mistress by Heinlein. And in that book, it is, it is an incredibly prescient 
I mean, about artificial intelligence, about other stuff. But anyway, so it's an anarchist revolution. It's an anarchist rebellion on the moon against the earth. But and one of the guys is a Bakuninist. So, I mean, Heinlein was knew his shit, but it was very authoritarian internally. And I just find that common in most of the libertarian science fiction, because I love science fiction. And I particularly like much of the libertarian stuff. The anarchist internal organization is always very hierarchical in all the books I've read. And the Moon's Ash Mistress was one, and I'm trying to think of a couple of others. But it's just a weird thing for people who are that critical of authority outside. Not all the anarchist couples are critical of authority either. I mean, they just, they're against the state, but not against voluntary authority. But it's a very conspiratorial organization. And that, but that's, that's how I would describe Konkin, more than hierarchical, it's conspiratorial. But again, the Kunin was the same way. So it's not a disease only of the right. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Anyways, getting back on track with the crowdsourced questions. Another listener asks, what level of industrial or social production do you think is possible in a society made up entirely of friendship or unions of egoists? I believe basically the same level of technology as other social forms can create. As a technology advance, advances, it's way easier to do things with fewer people as part of it, especially with things like 3D printing, the internet, renewable energy sources, and so on. I think back in the day when you had to have a factory full of human beings to create things, still do to some extent now, too. I'm not saying that this is going to fix everything. But things that have to be done in a massive scale can be done with fewer people. And I think that makes it easier to have what the left would say, horizontal relationships, I guess, in non-hierarchical forms. It's hard to know because we're not there. I mean, I just imagine that people can be nice and work together. I don't see why friends couldn't do these advanced technologies and big projects as easily as, you know, fellow workers in the, in the syndicalist sense. You know, and again, science fiction is something that has really helped me explore my ideas because then you, people tell stories about what it might look like in a way that I can't. I'm not that creative a thinker. And the Moon is a Hash Mistress was one. I think it was a, it was imperfect for sure, the structure there, but it did address a lot of stuff. And the other book is The Dispossessed, which was an advanced society, more advanced in the capitalist and the statist planet than in the anarchist planet. But even the anarchist planet had technology. It wasn't individualist. And that was kind of one of the points in the book was, you know, Shevek and Bedap and were individualists and they didn't play so well with the others. Um, and there was authority, and authority sort of was developing slowly in this society. It was very clear that there was a hierarchy in it. But I don't think the hierarchy necessarily goes along with technology. I think you can do it without. And I think you can do it either as a commune or as a group of individuals. Ken McLeod is another writer who's written his Fall Revolution series is addresses not formally a lot of these things. It's a very high tech anarchist society. Part of it. I mean, it's it. They they're all over the map. But there's you know one of the books is a communist. The solar system has become anarchist communist, and in some of the stories there's anarchist capitalist projects, and it just plays with ideas and and theoretical situations in a way that helped me think things through for myself. All right. So towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Yep. All right. First on the list is illegalism. I like it more in concept than in practice. I think like I mentioned the Bonnet Gang, Bono Gang, and again, I can't remember the dude's name in Italy was robbing the, the jewelry stores. This sort of Robin Hood feel to it, I like, but it's not something I'm going to go out and do. Antinomianism. Um, I think antinomianism inspired Garrison um, and also Ian Hutchinson back in um, colonial Boston days, who got thrown out of Massachusetts for speaking truth to power. Uh, but ga that Garrison's anarchism was informed by antino antinomianism. So I think it's good shit. <laughs> Radical fairies. I don't like this mystical piece of it. I mean, Jason Rogers is the guy who mentioned it. I think, I don't know if there was a left-hand Christianity article or something else. That was him, not me, who brought them up. Um, I know some of the, you know, the fag rag folks and the radical fairies kind of overlapped a bit, but I much prefer the fag rag, you know, confrontational approach to this, you know, hippy-dippy stuff. The affinity group. 
Affinity groups, I think, are fine if there's true affinity, but in fact, they were just sort of organizational cells often. I wasn't part of Clamshell, but back in the day, the Clamshell Alliance was organized back in Massachusetts, which was the anti nuke group, was organized on the basis of affinity groups. And they weren't, people weren't yet together based on affinity. They had to be a certain number and you got assigned to an affinity group. So I think if they're true, small, like minded groups of people working together on a project, fine. But generally, it's, a, it's, a, it's label for something that's not really based on affinity is called an affinity group as an organizational unit. Robert Anton Wilson. I love the dude. The Illuminatus, fabulous book. I've read some of his hippy-dippy mystical stuff, and even that I like for coming from him because of the way he plays with it. He's great on drugs. He's oh, He was always on drugs, but I meant <laughs> writing about drugs. I never met him in person. I, there is a VHS tape floating around of a conference that he's interviewed on that a friend of mine was also in. And he, and he also is, um, Robin Anton Wilson explains the world. There's a few tapes and videos out about him and he's fabulous excellent yeah we got the we got the name non-servium from uh the illuminatus trilogy you know where that came from it's i i do <laughs> james joyce and then the old testament before that right right it's 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 what lucifer said when he was being thrown out of heaven yep yep robert anton wilson got it from james joyce james joyce got it from the old testament the quote is attributed to Lucifer, which was thought to be, the translation was, I will not serve, but there's actually another translation, which was, I will not transgress, which coincidentally makes two pretty good principles for anarchism right off the bat. Huh. I didn't know about that ultimate. I, I know about that I will not serve. Good. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next one on the list, two more, by the way, Discordianism. I'm intrigued by it. it I mean, there's overlap between Robert Anton Wilson and Discordianism, and there's some other anarchists who were involved in it too. I can't re- remember who wrote Principia Discordia. It, it's good stuff. The whole Emperor Norton story is just a great story, which is that I learned about through the Principia, through the Discordians. Um, they sort of were insurrectionists in some ways. I mean, that they, they, these temporary autonomous zones and things were all. We, they didn't use the same words that Wilson uses, but sort of temperamentally, they were similar to some of these later ideas. You know, I didn't take it seriously. I mean, in Margot Adler's book, Drawing Down the Moon, actually has a chapter on it, taking it seriously as a pagan faith. And I don't know whether people really did it. I didn't really know any of the people personally. Well, it's supposed to be a joke pretending to be a religion or a religion pretending to be a joke, right? Exactly. And, you know, and, and Margaret did a good job, did a good job on the chapter, but it was kind of, I, I assumed it was always a joke pretending to be a religion, but it probably, <laughs> who the hell knows, right? Noam Chomsky. I mean, the reverence which people give to him is just amazing. I went to this talk in Boston years ago. It was Chomsky spoke, a couple of other people spoke. There was a film about Aung San Suu Kyi when she was one of the good guys back in the day. And they, they had him speak first. And once he spoke, 75% of the people left. It was like, you know, like his, his roadies at the thing. I mean, he, he's just regarded as near godlike uh, in the left, especially in Boston. But in the anarchists as a general seem to be very reverent, rever- reverential towards him. But he's a mean fuck. I mean, I, he spoke at Black Rose one time. Him and Howard Zinn were speaking. And Howard Zinn kind of says he's an anarchist sometimes, and he says he's a Marxist other times. He's dead now, but he was basically a decent man, though. He was nice. And somebody asked Chomsky a question from the audience, and not a mean question. She was some sort of pacifist, I think. Sounded like she might have been religious-based. And he fucking laid into her in a very, very mean way. And I've heard stories about the way he treats his students in class and stuff, too. And he's just, he's just kind of a dick. Um, and I also think, you need, I mean, what kind of fucking anarchist writes articles encouraging people to vote? It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> All right, last one is Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day. I think Dorothy Day was great. I think the Catholic workers do incredible work. Um, not work I would want to do, for sure. Um, but they put their money where their mouth is, as it were. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know them well. I went to a talk by some of the folks from the Catholic Worker, the Saints Therese and Francis Catholic Worker House in Worcester, Massachusetts. And for instance, he sent his kids to public school and talked about why. And lots of people do. I'm not criticizing him for that. But they're very thoughtful about everything they do. And he didn't just automatically send his kids to school, even though that's where he arrived. 
because they have this essential critique of the state. They were truly, most of them truly are anarchists, and, and Dorothy Day certainly was. And so they do these these houses of hospitality, as I'm sure you know, and they live among the homeless people themselves. They they own the house, obviously, and there's probably some mechanism for keeping people out. So it's not totally democratic, I imagine, but they do come pretty da- damn close to being, you know, very egalitarian project. And they, they, their religious stuff is fucking weird to me, though. I don't get why Dorothy Day could have such a complete critique of the state and capitalism. I mean, they won't put their money in a bank because it draws interest and interest is banned by the Bible because it's usury. They won't get tax-free status so that people who do- donate to them can't get a break on it. They just – they try to minimize any involvement they have with the state, short of sending the public school, obviously. So I think they're legit anarchists. But, you know, why Dorothy Day cares what the fucking Pope says when she doesn't care what the president says is beyond me. I see the connection. I mean, I think the Church of the Acts of the Apostle, which is kind of how they view them as the golden days of the church, Mm -hmm. is not what the Catholic Church is today. So I don't, it's bizarre shit that they can put these two crazy ideas in their head. They're also anti-abortion, but they're not, they don't support abortion laws either because they're anarchists. So interesting, interesting. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the actual end of our conversation here. Uh, Where should folks go to learn more about the topics that you're most passionate about? Um, The bad press site, of course. But other than that, it's interesting, I guess, just the Internet and typing an individual as the anarchist and see what you get. My stuff appears on lefty sites, not uncommonly. I mean, I think it's, I don't know whether it was Anarchismo or some site I was on the other day had several reprints of mine, which I had no fucking clue was out there. They like three different things. InfoShop has some of my stuff. I mean, I'm not the only one who writes. I'm just saying I was looking up my name, so that's why I know this stuff. So you do find individual stuff on the non-individualist sites. And I just think I, I love the internet. I waste a lot of time on it, of course. We all do, but... Just type in the words in Google and you'll it's remarkable stuff you'll find. I mean, I've found my stuff translated into Swedish and Turkish and Japanese and well, all over the world. I mean, that's basically it. I do I mean I do put out a paper copy because I still haven't gone post paper as well. And if people want that, they can get the the mailing address from the website or the email they can email me too, and I can send them a paper copy if they like. But basically I just make a PDF. The PDF online actually the graphics are way better because it's just they're, they're way, way clearer than when I print them out on paper. Um, but it's the exact same content as the paper one, the PDFs, and in the, in the same the formatting is exactly the same. I guess that's it. I mean, like Google me and see where else I show up. Joe Peacott, I can't thank you enough for uh, joining me. Oh, uh, happy to do it. I had fun. All right, everyone needs to go check out Joe Peacott's work at BadPress.net. And be sure to peruse all the other articles that he's republished there. I can assure you that they are definitely worth the read. Yeah, thanks again, Joe, for joining me. I really appreciate it and hope you have a good rest of your day. I'll do my best. You too. All right. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Good. Talk to you soon, Joe. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed my interview with Joe Peacott as much as I did. If you enjoy the work we do at Non-Servian Media, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash non Media. We've said it too many times to count, but it's true. Your support helps us keep this project going, and we deeply appreciate it. And if you can't donate financially, consider liking and sharing this episode. That helps us reach a larger audience and helps to spread the message of radical freedom and liberation. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.